Green means go. I will be watching too much Paw Patrol. <laughs> Something that they say. Paw Patrol. Okay, so our, our topic today is um, our moral obligations as educators. And um, while I'm moderating this, it's actually kind of the brainchild of Danny Dyer here on the, the panel. We'll be introducing everybody as, as we go by. Um, and we mean it, we mean it to be thought provoking, maybe a little controversial, but respectful, of course. We don't know if any tables and chairs are going to be thrown over and people storming out of the room. Um, and we do mean it to be something of a, a bit of a back and forth, um, though the number of people in the room is growing quite a lot. So we'll see what happens there. Um, but what we're going to do is um, introduce ourselves so who we are, uh, where we teach what we teach, um, and why we care about this topic in the first place. So I'm Jana Rosales. Um, I teach over in engineering, and I teach all of the um, courses in professionalism, communication, and ethics, or I co-teach them now, uh, which means I see the engineering students in the second year of their program and in the final year of their program, and I have very large classes of 200 to 300 students, and I care very much about their professional formation um, and how they relate both as professionals and human beings to the uh, people that they work with and to the projects that they work on and to the technologies that they create and the systems that they participate in that structure all of our lives and keep us all safe um, and, um, and look after our, our, our health and our well-being. Um, so that's kind of why I care about this. So I will go down the line and everybody will kind of do the same introduction. So I'm Christina Thorpe. Um, I'm a prof in the psychology department. But before you guys kind of start thinking, that means that I know a lot about, you know, psychology. There are different <laughs> kinds of psychology. Um, so the kind of psychology that I do is behavioral neuroscience. So how the brain works and how the brain influences behavior. Um, so I'm not a clinical psychologist. And in some ways, that actually, I think, is confusing to faculty. And it's also even confusing to our first year students who can kind of think that they can see me as a bit of a clinician. So it's trying to make sure that everyone understands that up front, which is why I wanted to start with it. Um, I'm also the deputy head of the psychology department, which means that I'm in charge of undergraduate programming. Um, and I think that I've, I deal with questions now about the kinds of courses that we should be teaching, what we should be focusing on, and also, dealing with things like student accommodations and deferred exams and, and I feel like there's been a lot more kind of moral issues that are coming up with me and I'm really, I'm, I'm having to go to my colleagues a lot to ask them questions and so I liked the idea of this being a chance for us to kind of talk and kind of figure out how we all feel um, about some of our moral obligations. Good afternoon, my name is Caroline Poor and I'm a registered nurse. I am an associate professor in the Faculty of Nursing. I have a doctorate in public health nursing. And I teach students who are emerging students, as our guest speaker spoke about yesterday. They are in the undergraduate program in first year, first semester. I also have students at the master's and the doctoral level. Um, I've been at the Faculty of Memorial, since, or I'm sorry, the Memorial University since 2010. I've been really excited to be teaching and I love <coughs> the fact that there's so much support and encouragement for teaching. When it comes to moral obligation, I th I've always thought that there's this tremendous burden almost on myself as I think about myself uh, teaching budding nurses to provide safe, compassionate, competent care. I'm uh, Danny Dyer from Math. Uh, I'm a graph theorist, and I get to teach sometimes in the third and fourth year, sort of in my area of interest. Uh, but I also do teach a lot in first year, and first year in math is, is sort of service teaching, right? I mean, I'm probably teaching a lot more of other people's students than I'm ever teaching sort of my own. Uh, but I also get lucky and get, sometimes get the chance in the, like the second year in like the courses that are really going to determine if you're going to be a math major or not, right? And they're very satisfying to teach as well. But so you, you, I end up seeing a, a lot of people with a great variance in ability uh, and, be absolutely honest, interest, right? I have a lot of extremely disinterested people in my, in my classroom. Uh, sometimes even before I start teaching. <laughs> um, yeah, and I'm just, I'm just interested in this. I'm, I'm inter I, like my colleagues, I'm very interested in teaching, and I think the, the moral dimension is an important one because... We have to deal with each other as human beings as well as, you know, just some sort of automatons. 
So uh, Danny proposed this panel to us and pulled us all together and we had a meeting about this a couple of days ago to hash out how we would do this and what it would look like. And, um, and I think all of us in our own teaching worlds wrestle with a lot of different moral obligations or just kind of dilemmas or, or questions um, about our practice. And <clears throat> some that can be, you know, very mundane classroom management types of things, which are still really important to the running of your course, to much bigger questions about what's the purpose of a university education anyway, and, you know, and how has it changed? Um, so I wanted to pose to our um, panel here, um, what are some of the moral obligations that you wrestle with as an educator, to, to give us a bit of a sense of how you define moral obligation in the first place? Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll kick it off with that. Okay, uh, one really basic one, uh, just, to, just as a topic, is how much time should I spend? You know, I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm very lucky. I'm a tenured faculty member now, you know, so like, ha ha, you know, like I can, I have supposed to have all this freedom, but, but of course, I also have the, 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 chains, <coughs> the chains of my own morality, right? I, I'm restricted by what I feel I should do. Uh, and, you know, I'm sure we all have colleagues who uh, mm -hmm. are research monsters, who, uh, who absolutely do everything they can to minimize the amount of teaching they, they have to do uh, and, and maximize the amount of research. And it's easy to understand why, right? The university puts a lot of pressure on us to do exactly that. Uh, but if you look at, like, collective agreement language, these are supposed to be roughly equal pillars of what we're supposed to do. Uh, and I feel obliged to the students in my classes to spend time with them and, and for them, right, in, in preparation and make sure I do a good job to give them an excellent chance to go ahead. So I, I, think, I think really time management, and which can go into work-life management, uh, is, is a really big moral question. Great, thanks. <coughs> Maybe Caroline will go with you. Well, I, I, I take a different sort of approach in response to that question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess, for me, when I think about teaching, well, I'm a, I'm a nurse uh, primarily, and even this moment, right now, this hour, there's a nurse out there teaching a patient. So when I came into Moore University as a, a faculty member, as an academic staff member, Teaching was already inherent within my role um, as a nurse. <coughs> and I felt, again, this tremendous burden almost that I've got to do the best that I can do. And it's my moral obligation not only to myself, the integrity of who I am as a nurse and now as a teacher, but it's a moral obligation to society itself, to families, to the persons in our care, to protect society. We have a code of ethics. We are bound by a code of ethics within our nursing role. I think of the teaching and learning framework almost as that kind of codified rules of how we should teach. It's almost like our code. And I think morally underlying that code are some moral values and principles that are there outlined for us. But th in some sense, those may feel like ideals that we cannot always apply in our classroom. And I think that's where the moral obligation comes in. To what extent will I espouse and apply what could be ideals within that teaching and learning framework? But as a nurse educator, I'm always grappling with this. Am I doing the best that I can so these budding nurses are going to be able to, again, provide safe, confident, compassionate care? Can I instill in them a value to want to learn this information? Can I still in them a value to act compassionately and empathetically in all situations? Can I instill with them um, an attitude and behavior that they will get along with other nurses, with other interprofessional um, team members on a team? Can, will they advocate for their patients? So the moral obligation is complex and multiple layers. And I really think that we do bring to the teaching role, whether it's in nursing or mathematics, a sense of self, of who am I? And so when I came into this role, I was a nurse, a human being that wanted to care for others. And I tried to instill that kind of passion for nursing with my students. 
So I guess for me, one of the things that I've been thinking about the most in terms of moral obligation, which I hinted at the beginning, um, that's coming up with me a lot. I mean, we've been hearing at the conference already a lot about how, you know, we're moving away from just being someone who's teaching a lot of content, but to also kind of helping these people as they become, you know, emerging adults and what they want to be. And I'm finding that there are, there are so many extra issues going on with students. Mm -hmm. And I feel at the end of the day, I'm going home saying, oh my God, that student is really, really struggling with, you know, an academic issue or a mental health issue or a financial issue or, and so much more of that I feel like I'm getting. And what's my moral obligation, right? Like, I, how do you, is that my job, right? Like I aim so that I go to bed at night and I'm not kicking myself saying I should have handled it better. But <clears throat> I also have a moral obligation to NSERC who provides me money to do research and that the taxpayers are paying for it, a moral obligation to my family. And, and so kind of, I think that's what's happening with my, where I'm struggling a lot is how do I balance all of that extra kind of moral obligation to my students and their well-being, and is that even my role? Like, I wasn't trained for this, right? So I, I think that's kind of a big part of it for me. <coughs> Great, thank you. Um, now, I think all or most of us here at the conference care in some way about teaching. Um, and there, there's things sometimes we kind of teach because we have to teach, um, but we, we, we you know, um, are, are drawn to teaching in, in one capacity or another. And so I wanted to pose to the panel um, to think about, you know, why do you care about what you do? You've kind of touched on it, but, but do a little bit of a, a deeper dive. Why do you care about teaching? What maybe drew you to it in the first place? Um, but how has your care changed over time? Like, did you come in and kind of keep the same um, aspects of care, level of care? Um, or has that changed over over time? And then, like, what are some of the, the challenges that you've encountered to your sense of care as an, a, an educator over time? We didn't decide what order we'd go in ahead of time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've certainly evolved and uh, changed in how, uh, how I respond to the job. I mean, uh, when, when you're an undergraduate, you don't really know what the job is. Right? I mean, you might have this dream of someday being a professor or something, but it doesn't mean that you even understand what fundamentally makes it up. I always said I want, as an undergraduate, I wanted to be a math professor because I wanted to be able to go to matinees in the middle of the day. <laughs> and uh, and you, you, you could leave and just go, like, because you're free, right? And, like, I, I would love the chance to get to go to see some of these matinees sometime, <laughs> right? But it just doesn't kick in very often, right? So, so uh, I wanted to be a professor for a long time, but I don't know if I knew really what the job was. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I think part of it is, is just personal pride, right? I mean, you want to do a good job in teaching because uh, you are doing it, right? And, and you know, if you want to be a, a sensible and respected person, uh, you you have to act respectably. You know, you have to you have to do the job, right? You can't just phone it in. Uh, so that's sort of personal obligation, I guess. Uh, I, I do think it's, it's always, it, we're getting paid. We have an obligation uh, to, to our employer to do the job we're getting paid to do, right? So I think there's a real obligation there, and uh, that affects me. I think about that. And, you know, when you're, you know, staring in at the ceiling late at night and thinking about, you know, what am I doing with my life? Uh, you know, maybe that's when I'm really getting into societal obligation. And the reason I want to do a good job is because I owe it to everyone in the world to be able to do it. You know, I certainly have, I owe it to the people, the bums in the seats, right? You know, they've, they've paid money, right? It's time to see the show. Uh, that being said, we all have terrible days, right? I mean, there's certainly days where you walk back and say, oh my God, like what a hash I just made of that class, right? Maybe you made a fundamental mistake, you know, maybe you never got enough sleep uh, the night before, maybe whatever, right? It happens. And in those things, you, all you can do is just, well, you just, you go in, you try to owe up to it the next time and say, oh, God, God sorry about last time. But uh, you try to move on and do the best you can the next day. So but that, maybe that's a change. I, 
I realize I'm not always the best possible me, uh, including in the classroom, and, and you try to be you try to be the best, but you try to be better when you're not. That was beautiful, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I still think my enthusiasm for um, working with nursing students is still there. Uh, I think it gets problematic when you have 80 students instead of maybe a nice class of 32 or a nice group of uh, 10, 11, or 12. That makes it problematic. And when they sort of stare at you, you have done something that you think is exciting and you think they're going to value this particular patient situation and they're all excited and they just sort of look at you with this blank stare. <laughs> and to tell you the truth, I can't read affect anymore. I can't tell if they're excited, enthusiastic. I never ask 80 students, what do you think? It's always think, pair, share. You know, individually think about what, about what you've just seen on the film here. Think about this uh, person in the bed who is now suffering with cancer. Talk to your partner about that and then talk to the per people behind you and share in this group of four. Because whenever you ask a group of 80, I don't know why there is a reluctance when every day they are watching reality shows and they're, they're showing, you know, what they've eaten for breakfast and they're all discussing things. But when it comes to posing a question in front of a large class first semester, first year, and I understand maybe there's an in him inhibition there if they haven't had practice experience. They just sort of stare with sort of this, I guess it's not what I, I expect. And so as I try to show caring and try to show more enthusiasm and perhaps feeling a little bit insecure that, oh, am I sensing that they're not engaged? Is something, should I shift now? Should I do something differently? But then afterwards, you get this comment from somebody or another faculty member, wow, they really loved your class, really, they really got that, really, they were really enthusiastic, really. So I don't know what the magic is about getting to know your students when there's a large class, as our speaker talked about yesterday, but I do love to care for students, and I really think that when we show we care for students, they in turn will be good human beings, and in, of course in nursing and medicine, they will show that same kind of care for their people in their care. So it's really critical that we continue with all patience and uh, resilience uh, to carry out our enthusiasm. I'm not meant to preach to you, but I'm supposed to respond, but <laughs> anyway, I thought I'd just add that comment. Can I say one thing before it goes to you? No. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, or, or fake it, right? I mean, if, if, I, I agree with the caring. But even if you don't care, yes. fake it. Yep. It's true. No, you smile even though you're feeling, I could just go strangle that person right now. You have to. You have to. Yeah. It takes patience. Yep. Yeah. So I guess for me, um, what drew me to teaching and one of the things that I love is that I teach a, lar well, a pretty large section of intro psych. So how many of you guys have done intro psych at some point? So it has to be one of the most fun courses ever to teach, right? It is, there are so many cool examples and people don't care when they take first year math. Um, they, they come in and they are motivated, like they <laughs> want to know about psych. And so it's just like, you can, it, it's a show, right? Like you can put things up and they are loving it. And then they come to me saying, Christina, that's it. I want to be a psych major. I want a behavioral neuroscience major. And I'm just like, okay. So now it's my responsibility to make sure that you kind of get through the degree. Um, I also teach <coughs> that super fun first year course. And then if I told you that I also teach a mandatory second year course on writing, um, you can imagine the enthusiasm I get for that one. <laughs> Um, but it's important and it's about critical thinking and writing, communication, all of those skills that we think are so important. But I go from a Thursday night class of students who are sitting on the edge of their seat going, oh my God, what is Christina going to teach me about tonight? To, oh God, she's going to talk to me about grammar today, <laughs> right? Like it's, so yeah, so I think that's the kind of things that have changed. It was always about how can I make it the most exciting and how can I engage them and I do still think that's really important but now it's also all the other components about how to kind of guide them through the whole degree. 
So one of the nubs of what we were discussing when we met about this, <coughs> and, and it's something that Danny threw out to us when he put the panel together, is do we have an obligation, and I'm posing this question to you folks as well, do we have an obligation to teach, simply to teach, or to teach well? And what does it mean to teach well? And I want to get the panel's response to this. Um, you know, what does teaching well or teaching at your best look like for you and your students? And then we're going to try to take a chance uh, and open it up to you folks uh, for your responses as well. What does it mean to, to teach well? And do you think you have a moral obligation to, to teach, to show up and do the thing for whatever time you, you got for what you're paid for, or to teach well? Uh, there's a lot of you, and, and I don't know if everyone's going to rush at the microphone or what. We're going to see what's going to happen. Um, but Jennifer will be running around with the mic. We'll hear likely from a few people because we have other questions that we want to get to as well. But um, this is where audience participation comes into, into play. So what does it mean to teach well? And can we go back down this way just to sure. shake it up a little bit? So, <laughs> so how about this? I will be the person who will say the thing that no one's going to agree with because I don't really either. But basically, so long as I don't teach bad, I'm teaching good, right? Like, so long as I don't do anything terrible, according to the collective agreement, when I go up for p and so long as students don't despise me, then I've done a good job, right? Like, that's, that's how it feels sometimes as a university instructor is, so long as they are not lynching you and going to the head, then you are awesome and you're doing great. Then you have the flip side where the past, you know, 24 hours at this conference, I'm thinking, oh my God, I suck. Like, it never even occurred to me to try to find out what my students believed in before the first class. Like, that never dawned on me, so, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I'm either the best thing ever or I'm a piece of crap. Bleep. Yes. So I don't know. Similarly, as long as I tell them uh, how to walk in the room and check the IV, what else matters, really? As long as I don't kill somebody. That's my job. Just fill up the empty vessels right then. <laughs> Put the stuff in, write the exam, multiple choice, away you go. Hi, Marks, you've hey, done there's it. There's nothing wrong with multiple choice questions. <laughs> <laughs> All of you people who have done digital psych know what I'm talking about. Okay. So much easier than those papers. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't have to mark papers normally, so uh, I've got that going for me, right? I mean, it's tests, assignments, that kind of stuff. Uh, okay, so I, I ask, it it's worth going into your life and not saying just about teaching, but people you know, friends, family, whatever, asking them, uh, I think, what that question is. Are they being paid to do their job or are they being paid to do their job well? I think it's, very, I think it's a fundamentally interesting question. Uh, I think I'm paid to do my job well, uh, but I think it's personally because I'm valued, I feel valued in my job, right? And it could be monetarily, it doesn't have to be. Uh, but I, I think that even if I sort of wasn't being paid Maybe I wouldn't do my job well. It's easier, I think, to, to stop and say if I didn't feel valued or important or anything. But I, I do think I'm, I think it's morally I'm, ob I'm obliged to do my job well. And so it means, you know, like I try to do my research well, or I try to work with my, my grad students well. I try to serve on whatever, you know, committee I get stuck with well, right? <laughs> you know, as part of my service commitment to the university. Uh, but yeah, so I, I, I do. You know, but, but, but do it well, I mean, sometimes that can vary from day to day. How well you can do it today maybe is not going to be how well you can do it tomorrow either. So just some thoughts anyway. Okay, thanks. So now, if there are folks in the audience who would like to, to weigh in about your own moral obligation as an educator, and you can tell us who you are and, and what you teach, Thank you. I'm Joel Deshay from the Department of English. I teach mainly Canadian literature, also film and literary theory. I thank you for your wonderful panel. I'm really excited by this. I was, I'm sort of drawn back to Danny's original uh, question about um, do I give enough time to my teaching? For me, it's the opposite. I, I, for eight or nine months out of the year, I can't make enough time for my research, and that's a problem. 
So uh, how do I teach well in that context where teaching takes over my whole life? Well, one of the things that I think we need to do more generally, I'm talking about myself personally and in observation of my colleagues and of conferences like this, not only here but elsewhere, we should be taking evidence-based approaches to our teaching practices. Let's do some things that work, that we know work, that educational professionals have studied. Let's try that. Uh, it's great to do it by experience. It's great to do it by ideology. Those things can all work, but I think we should study teaching and do our research on teaching, bring that to the classroom. Thank you. What other comments? In the room. So is Amy, I saw Amy back there. Second and third. Um, so my name is Amy Todd. I'm an educational developer with CITL, and I also teach uh, primarily third and fourth year courses in biochemistry. Um, and just kind of thinking about Danny's kind of reflection on, you know, like what are we paid to be here to do? Um, I mean, we all kind of know there's issues with the P&T process. Um, what? <laughs> but uh, <coughs> I think um, the big defining thing is whether or not you're trying to improve. Uh, I think it's kind of like parenting, whether that's with a human baby or a fur baby, um, <laughs> that everyone's going to do everything differently. We're going to have good days. We're going to have bad days. Um, but the difference between, in my mind, a good parent and a parent that maybe needs to try a little harder is, yeah, the extent to which you're trying. And I see that in teaching as well. So whether or not you're trying, whether that means, you know, looking up for research and best practices and, and kind of taking up that SOTL approach to teaching or coming to conferences like this or just reflecting on what did I do this semester, what should I change next semester, as opposed to the instructors that I know everyone's had somewhere along the way where they're just kind of a carbon copy of their course every semester, sometimes with the dates not changed. So you see, you know, something dated three years ago and they only change things when a new edition of a book comes out. Um, so in my mind, that's the difference. Uh, it's not so much whether or not you think you're a success, because I think that's always evolving, but uh, whether you're trying and making the effort. And I think that's something that we are paid to do. Thank you. OK. Um, Kelly, we saw you with the mic. Um, so I teach first year physics. My experience is a little bit different from your guys because I don't have tenure and I don't have a path to tenure so I'm on a three-year contract mm. so I guess if I don't teach well I think my job could be at risk mm -hmm. so I guess in that sense I'm definitely paid to teach well um, on another level it's kind of who I am I'm an all-in person I go 30 for 60 I don't just run I run a marathon it that's just who I am um, but another thing in teaching physics when you ask people about physics they normally say, ah, oh, right? People, why do you teach physics? Why do you like physics? And I, I guess for me, part of my goal and my moral obligation is for the 200 students in my class to say, yeah, I did a physics course. That was really neat, right? You know, maybe more like your experience in psychology because I think most of our disciplines are actually really neat. And what we bring to the table is to show them that, not to make everybody a physicist, but to show them there's just so much cool stuff in the world, and that feels like part of my obligation. Yeah. Thank you. Hello, I'm Lourdes Peña Castillo, teaching computer science and biology, uh, first year courses, third year courses, and graduate courses. And, well, I will get back to my first time I teach here at university. So it was 10 years ago, and I wanted to do a good job teaching. But I have no idea what it was teaching. I mean, I have a PhD in computer science. I can do programming. I can do other things. Teaching? It was the first time I was sitting in front of students and saying, OK, I want to do a good job. What does that mean to do a good job? <laughs> so basically, all here in, uh, during these 10 years, and I try to teach well, it has been a learning experience. So every year is learning what it works, trying something new, and trying to teach. I mean, not to teach, I try to get the students to learn something from the course. So if I get at the end of the course and the students have learned something, <laughs> I think I have done my job well. Um, and that's something that is, has been always learning. Like from the first time I 
to stop on the class room. And I'm like, ah! And I still get bump gusses every time. My first day of class, every time I'm like, they would like me, they, I will do a good job. So I'm still nervous the first day, and I'm still trying to learn what is to do well in teaching. So I don't know, I think I don't know yet what is that for everyone. It's just a learning experience. Uh, I, I still get weak knees before first class of a semester. That something still happens to me too. Every class. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So you, you raised a good point um, about being the subject matter expert because the university historically is predicated on the fact that if you're subject matter expert, then that qualifies you to stand up in front of a class of people and let, or and let everybody you know kind of teach to, to, to teach you what you know to, to other people. So Valerie, do you want to make a point? Uh, I do. Um, I take it I have to use this for the yeah. benefit of other people. Um, uh, Jana, I, I did want to intervene at that point. Um, uh, Valerie Burton, and I would like to use that trite phrase, I teach people. And I'm going to use that trite phrase because it became meaningful to me when I stepped outside my department, when I stepped outside my secure base of knowledge as an historian. And Memorial funded me for five years to explore the morality of teaching in relation to our most challenged students with our most gifted teachers. And I have to thank three of you. I'm not thanking Christina because I think she arrived on the scene too late to be part of first year success, but she would have been part of first year success. Um, so I stepped outside being an historian to explore many of the areas that you've been talking about and I think I had quite a different experience in my own education as well as the team providing quite a different experience which has seen um, nearly uh, 500 students go through Memorial from a very different base. First year success was not uh, continued. I remain grateful for the experience that I received. But I do want to move back into disciplinary ground. And maybe this is the point at which I do want to turn my comments back to you, and I am trying to be brief, but where I want to go does need a little bit of explanation. And that is the way that the intellectual as well as the political world in which we live has changed and that in which our students live has changed. Uh, by all means, talk about the, the politics of uh, Newfoundland and the special responsibility to the people of the province, which I've always found a marvelously ambiguous phrase in the way that it does actually allow us to approach the morality of what it is we do that is specific in this province. But I do want to go to a slightly different area, which is the way in which our intellectual worlds have changed. Our taxonomies of knowledge have changed. Our understandings of what we're actually teaching have changed on a moral base. And I do want to draw the distinction between morality and virtue, because I think a lot of the points that you addressed were about virtue rather than the morality of our pedagogies. The moralities of our pedagogies have fundamentally changed because of the end of a positivistic, almost, and I'm going to use the word scientistic in the hope I don't upset the scientists in the room, a scientistic vision that neutrality, that the arguments predominantly of fact and number were the ones that called um, the uh, questions of our age. I think we're much more now in a framework where we understand that a form of objectivity which allows us to talk about how we're positioned uh, is much closer to questions of morality than we have perhaps been since the Enlightenment. So I'm talking about a big, big shift. Um, but we're in a world where morality is, has almost been made a chance game. And I am referring there to political 
developments. So some of the um, uh, misconceptions that Caroline in particular uh, pointed out about when we're standing in the classroom, are we actually communicating, originate on that very um, ambiguous and confusing relationship that we have with the real world where morality, frankly, isn't talked about very much, but morality is used as a hook in so many different contexts. Am I making clear where I'm going with this attempt to root us both in the social context of our learning and the intellectual endeavor of what we're doing? And have I given you enough to perhaps comment on that? I know I've handed you a lot there, but you know, well, Memorial's five years that it funded me resulted in a, a great <laughs> amount of thinking about so this. So are you able to package it into a question then? Okay. Um, the question would be, um, how do you now position yourselves? And, and I think you're probably all of the age when at least when you came into undergraduate scholarship, it very much was the question of the old forms of scientific objectivity that ruled and perhaps your instructors didn't go down avenues of, you know, morality is important here. These questions are important here. How do you see this has changed and how might that influence what each of you has identified as the problems within the classroom of engaging on a real world basis? Sorry, even that sure. question was long. <laughs> Thank you, Valerie. Um, and I think it connects back to, to what I was um, saying before in terms of historically it's predicated on, okay, if you're subject matter expert, that qualifies you to stand up and teach. Whereas I think all of our experience now is that there's so much more to teaching than just that. And, and thinking about things like inclusivity and intersectionality and social justice and all this, and I, I'm talking about this stuff in engineering, or I'm trying to anyway. Um, it, it's, it's, it really shakes up kind of what our, our whole idea of what a university is for. Um, so that's just my little comment on it, and I'll open it up to our panelists to respond. Um, as you were speaking, Valerie, I was thinking about authenticity. And um, I love the writings of uh, Palmer Parker, or Parker Palmer. Uh, he has a beautiful book about courage to teach, and he says, teaching is not reduced to technique. Teaching is as good as the integrity and identity of the teacher. And he wrote that book uh, in 1998. But I think we have this facade that we're all talking now about self-compassion and we're talking about being real and we're talking about transparency. Well, we're seeing, and you mentioned the political sector, we're seeing around us in society, especially our political leaders, there's a false projection of authenticity and realism. And so that makes me question, are we really talking about morals? Are we really talking about moral obligation as perhaps I think of moral obligation? Somebody else living in today's society when there's so much um, surprise almost, I'm, I'm, I, I can't help but being surprised but at what I hear and see, that's not authenticity, that's not transparency. What is that about? That's supposed to be about morality? No. So you have this in sense that we're living in a society where uh, we can, in an instant, show what is real, but we really don't know what is real because then it's always kind of eclipsed by a false sense of what's real. Take fake news, for example. I never would have heard about fake news 10 years ago. So I think it's a challenge to be real and to have people really trust you that, yes, I am morally obligated, and you can trust that. Thank you. Other comments? Uh, any moral philosophers can, you know, close their hands, you know, close their ears for a second. But I mean, I, I'm in a subject where I deal with absolute truth, and so that has not changed uh, a great deal. Uh, but uh, I am very aware of my place in the classroom. Right? I am a uh, a straight white man. I mean, I've got it made. Right? I mean, if I if I do nothing, right, the system is set up to work for me. Right? Uh, but what I at least try to be is aware of those privileges that society inherently grants me and try to negate the lack of those privileges in my classroom, 
right? So uh, I try to be aware of who gets to ask questions and who gets to start and shut down conversation. Uh, I try to make myself available to students, you know, whenever I can because, you know, socioeconomic things may mean they have a job, right? And so they can't come to an office hour that I arbitrarily decide is convenient for me. Uh, I try to respond to emails for the same reason, right? Though I, you know, keeping track of my own time, I put limits on how frequently I will agree to do that. Uh, I, I take any song and dance story of why they can't write a midterm, right? If all they got to do is email me and tell me they're sick, well, if they tell me their cat got run over and they're all broken up about it, I'll say, okay, well, you know, okay, so be it. Uh, but it comes from a place of uh, uh, at least questioning why I'm the big power uh, in, in the classroom, uh, which I think is relevant to, to modern society, for sure, and uh, in the current state that we live in. So I'm not sure if this will directly answer what you're getting at, but maybe it's uh, similar enough. I feel that because of the way that the political climate is now, I'm much more careful about trying to, and, and I don't think this is the right answer, I know I shouldn't be, but I get stuck in this trap of not wanting to talk about things that are going to be too controversial because there's always going to be someone, or that you feel like there's always gonna be someone mm. who gets upset. And that's a shame because how do we, you know, I liked having the professors who would ask something to kind of provoke me and get me thinking about things in a different way. And I think that a lot of younger faculty members are so afraid to kind of tackle some of those things because we don't want to be, you know, on the front of the telegram, right? Um, you know, or you want to ask questions about, you know, accommodations that students have, but you're afraid to kind of talk about it because of what the climate is. And so I guess that's kind of. So um, time is a harsh master, <laughs> probably messing up the whatever the quote was, but um, we had a whole trove of other questions to do much deeper dives on this mm -hmm. stuff because we were talking about accommodations, we were talking um, about student mental health, we were talking about the purpose of the university, so we had <laughs> discussed this amongst ourselves. Uh, we wanted to make it um, a little bit interactive though for you mm -hmm. folks to be able to, to make your points and ask your questions. Uh, and so time's not quite on our side. Um, we recognize that, but, but we wanted to seed um, some thoughts and questions with you that, well, it's lunchtime, is it not? So we can move you know, on into lunchtime to, to be able to talk about that in, in whatever group you fi might find yourself in. Um, I, so I just wanted, oh, it's not, okay, we're, hold that.